we are going to continue with what we were working on, which is sol solving solid mechanics problems. Um, last class, we solved one on thick walled pressure vessels. So any, any object that is axisymmetric and is experiencing some radial pressure either uh, internally, kind of on, on the walls from the inside of a, of a cylinder, or externally, or both. Um, we had to use everything that we had learned. We had to start with our kinematic relations between stress and displacement, sorry, strain and displacement. We had to insert that relationship between strain and displacement into our equations that we derived for the stress in polar coordinates for an axisymmetric object. We reduce that to a differential equation, an ordinary differential equation for our unknown displacement field. We solve that and inserted that back in to calculate the stresses uh, and evaluated what the stresses of the th thick walled pressure vessel are and their displacements. And I went through a Mathematica notebook showing you all what, um, how to visualize those stresses and kind of the power of, of of having done this calculation. We used equilibrium equations that were in the absence of any body forces. <clears throat> that led to a homogeneous ordinary differential equation. That word might ring a bell. Um, we're going to do a, a variant of this problem today, looking at a totally different set of applications, which result in fairly similar equations. And again, we're going to break off into breakout groups, uh, breakout rooms, and work through uh, the details of this problem kind of in small groups. Um, but first, I wanted to kind of do two things. One is say that we have some homework due next week. It's just two problems, and they're in your textbook, problems 8.35. That problem is related to the work that we did last class, which has to do with um, the residual stress that occurs in an object that's been shrink fit, which is a really common engineering practice and uh, manufacturing techniques to, to take something that's a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller than the object that it's going to be wrapped around or put inside, kind of force it in and let it exert a little bit of uh, outward or inward pressure on the object, which results in a really strong uh, fit called a shrink fit. And the we talked about kind of motivating some of the thick wall pressure vessel stuff by talking about residual stress in objects uh, related to uh, aerospace engineering in terms of cold riveting on, on airplanes. That pressure or that stress in the object, the radial and azimuthal stresses when you shrink fit an object so that there's no like applied pressure, you just kind of insert something in there. And then when it comes to its original size, it, it kind of continuously exerts pressure. Those stresses are residual stresses. They're just going to be in that object until you kind of remove the, the, the fitting, which you usually don't do. So these are, you're actually going to calculate some of the residual stresses we talked about. The second problem will have to do with what we're going to discuss today, which is spinning disks. So spinning disks um, has every uh, relates to um, the spinning speeds of CDs, Blu-rays, DVDs. Um, it's there's a big issue with spinning disks in which they become unstable when they're when the stress inside the object gets too large. Now, for something like a CD, that's not that big of a deal. You always kind of spin those at the same speed, and so who cares? But up until fairly recently, uh, all of our hard drives were spinning disk hard drives. And if you, if you were really into computers, you might remember kind of hard disk specs where the price of a, of a hard drive would go up with the speed that it would spin at. And so you would have older hard drives spinning at 5,000 RPMs and then 7,800 RPMs and then 10,000 RPMs. Uh, they could access, read and write data faster. 
but a lot of care had to be taken in manufacturing these things because those those discs that are spinning can become unstable. And if they become unstable, they'll deflect out of plane and hit the right head. You can extend these spinning discs to aerospace applications in calculating um, what is happening in uh, spinning turbines. And so kind of adding uh, uh, kind of blades onto the end of your disc or kind of almost thinking of it as like cutting segments out of your large disc. The same types of mechanics are, are useful extending this to say uh, spinning turbine discs. And you can see there's a couple of problems. I didn't uh, assign them for homework because they're a little bit harder. Um, but if you flip through around problem 8.44 in your textbook, you'll at least get to see a couple of problems that are uh, closer to uh, or related to, to turbines um, and, other, and other kind of spinning uh, motors. Um, I, want, I thought it'd be fun to at least show you some motivation for this, or at least if not motivation, just something interesting that you might not know happens. So here is a video of a CD being spun at ridiculous speeds just for fun. Um, and so you can kind of watch what happens to this. We'll watch it front on, but it's actually much more, I think, frankly, kind of shocking when you watch it a little bit of a side angle. So we'll watch this, let this play for a minute or two. They're filming at incredibly high speeds. That's ridiculous. We shot 96 gigs. In that, in. Oh, look at that. That's awesome. Just the shape it makes when it shatters. Like a little tree. Wow, that's cool. That is amazing. That's wicked. That is amazing. It goes like either side of the middle hole, doesn't it? Like, just follows the shape of the CD and then finally meets up again at the other side. So now what we're doing is one we're second going. before we look at it from the side, because this is going to be a little bit interesting because we're going to solve this problem in a minute. And one of the main things I'm going to ask you to do is to find out where the stress is the largest. And the stress isn't at the largest at the edge of the CD. It's the largest somewhere in the CD that's not at the inner or the outer edge. And it's a little bit surprising that this thing would break starting at the edge of the CD. So the question is, why is it breaking out there? Well, the reason is, as we'll see in a second, it, one of the assumptions that we're using in our model breaks before the structure uh, fails. We can talk more about it if you're interested, but let me show you what happens next. And you can see how that assumption breaks. And the assumption is twofold. One, that we have axisymmetric deformations, and two, that everything's planar. The CD rig, so the camera is looking down the edge, so we can hopefully see how much it warps from the side angle, which I think would be interesting. And we'll film this at 28,500 frames a second again. Dan's just doing some final touches to the artwork of the CD. Idea of the warp speed. Oh, oh what word. is happening? Look at that. It doesn't even look like a CD anymore. Oh, that's amazing. Look it's at so that. bent. It's spinning like at a different speed, so it's warp. That's amazing. The warp just seems to be staying there while the CD spins further and further around, almost like the air is pushing it. It looks like <laughs> it's ridiculous. crazy. It's ridiculous. I think it's trying to take off. That's awesome. You can see why it gives out. Yeah, that is some, sh that is some force. I would have thought that the warp would have gone around with the disc. If you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. All right, here's the moment of impact. Oh. <laughs> see you later. Oh, all the bits that hit <laughs> the vice just exploded. <laughs> oh man, it got pulverized. Yeah, solid. Well, that was some incredible footage. I've never seen that. That's 
so you saw right then that thing was incredibly warped. It had these wave patterns. And uh, the guy on the right said something like, the warp doesn't seem to be moving around with the CD. It almost seems like it's staying in place. So what happened is, as you spin this disc, the stress gets larger and larger, and it leads to an instability. It's very similar to a buckling instability. And that instability causes this thing to buckle and form waves. And what's really fascinating about these waves is that they're what's referred to as standing waves in a rotating frame. So it looks, and it is as such, that the waves are standing still, even though the material points are spinning. This type of instability, where you have a thin disc, which it, when spun leads to a standing wave in a rotating frame has been used for centuries really in a ancient Persian dance known as the whirling dervishes. So let me show you a very, the same instability in a completely different context. It'll start and you might be able to see it. These things are draping. So it's a little bit different. They don't start initially planar. They're, they're, they're like a cone. So your flat disc is a flat sheet. A cone, you know what a cone is, but the thing we're going to remember back in the back of our heads is going back to the beginning of the semester and we talked about how a cone and a flat sheet both have the same Gaussian curvature, which is they're both effectively flat in terms of the geometry. So what you'll see at the beginning is you, you'll, I think you'll start to see this kind of standing wave and rotating frame, but it'll zoom in and you'll get to get a, a better look at it. But this is the same instability. Spinning disc, axisymmetric, leads to a, a, a pattern with a finite number of kind of waves. And then those finite number of waves kind of stand still as the material points move over and around them. Might, like, a very keen observer might have noticed like a slight discoloration under the bottom of the of the skirts um, that they hang a little bit of felt on there to give it a little bit of extra weight to the bottom of these. The fact that the wave isn't standing still and the fact that that felt is there are kind of human necessities. It's hard to spin fast enough to uh, get the standing wave. Uh, without that extra help. You can do, we've done it in my lab. We've hooked up skirts to um, basically a, a DC motor and just spun it. And you can get all sorts of standing wave patterns uh, without any of these other um, things to help you out or without the fact that the, the wave is actually slowly drifting over time. Um, but these are the same instabilities. And these instabilities are coming from taking a disc that is intrinsically flat and spinning it fast enough and so I want us to work on kind of the, the simpler version of this today, which is understanding what the stresses are and the displacements of a disc that's being spun. Um, and it'll be another opportunity for us to practice our, our solid mechanics work that we've been, that we've been going through.
And so I want to set up the problem for you. It's really not that different from what we've had with, uh, last class. We're going to have a We're going to have a disk here. And now this disk could either have a, um, could either be an annulus, like a CD. You know, you think of a CD, it's got that little hole in the center that you can put on top of the thing that's going to grab it and spin it. Uh, or it doesn't have to be. It could just be a sheet that is spinning and has no hole at the center. If you get far enough along, you'll be able to check to see what effect that hole has on the stresses in the object. It's definitely a, a non-negligible effect. Um, we're going to have this thing spinning. And it's going to spin with a constant angular speed of omega. Omega is a constant angular speed, which is in the units of radians per second. We'll say that our disk has some mass density rho. It's going to be a, a mass per volume. The one of the things that's really dominant in the whirling dervish problem that's not apparent in the um, in the spinning Blu-ray DVD CD problem is that for the whirling dervish problem, gravity is really important. So you have this body force of gravity that's acting to pull things down. Here we're going to neglect gravity. So there's going to there's definitely a gravitational force which would go as F G just going to look like rho G. We're going to neglect this one. How would you know you have to neglect something? Well, we talked really early in the semester about what's referred to as the elastogravity length. What you would do is you would compare the bending rigidity of your object to the gravitational potential energy that's acting to bend it and see if the ratio of bending energy to gravitational potential energy is really large. That means bending is so high compared to the, uh, the, for, uh, the potential exerted by gravity that the object's not going to really bend. So we're going to we're going to neglect this term. However, there is going to be a radial, or sorry, a rotational body force. Due to the angular speed that is going to be added to our axisymmetric field equations what i mean is as this thing spins the spinning is kind of pulling this thing in, in a radial tension it's like if you're uh spinning in your in your chair here and you put your arms out or you put your arms in it's going to change your angular speed and so that that distance is going to kind of pulling you in they're tucking you in these are um there are i believe this is referred to as like a coriolis effect um in when you're talking about the material points moving on the edge of the of the disc so what i'm looking for you to do is to first determine what the rotational body force is. Then we're going to do some stuff that's really similar to what we did last class. So I think hopefully this one will go a little bit smoother. You're going to remember your strain is a function of displacement. So your kinematic equations. Then you're going to turn to your stress as a function of displacements, because we know stress is a function of strain through our constitutive relations, but we're going to use our relationship from our kinematic equations to get our stress in, in terms of our displacements.
Then we're going to use our equilibrium equations. Axis symmetric. Polar coordinates. The main difference between this time and last time is last time we had no body force. This time we have a radial body, uh, a body force in one of the uh, directions. As you'll remember, our, we only have our axisymmetric polar coordinate problem only depends in the radial coordinate, right? We had uh, ordinary differential equation. So it was something like D stress in the radial direction by dr uh, plus the difference in your stresses over r is equal to zero. In this case now it's the same stuff I just said plus this radial body force or rotational body force. The result of putting all these things together should be a ODE for U, it should be second order. And in fact, as you'll find out, depending on how much you remember from your differential equations courses, last class, we ended up with a homogeneous equation. Thick wall pressure vessels, we'll call it that. We had something that looked like this. U double prime plus one over R U prime plus one over R squared U is equal to zero. Oh, maybe that's a minus there, sorry. The fact that our, if we moved all of the dependent variables to the left-hand side, and we had nothing on the right-hand side, this is a homogeneous ordinary differential equation. What you're gonna find with this problem you're going to have some differential equation equals something that's not zero over here. So this is the modulus, and this is the particular. You can either use Mathematica to help you through this part of the problem. Or if you remember your differential equations work pretty well, you might be able to take a shortcut and not have to use Mathematica here. At this point, oops, what happened down here? There we go, let's try that again. At this point, you should have your stresses, in terms of everything except your unknown constants again, second order OD, which means we're gonna have two constants. We have to apply our boundary conditions to get C1 and C2. And the final thing I'd like you to do is to determine where is the radial stress the largest? At what R? If you make it this far really fast, you can have a, there's a bonus thing I could ask you, which is what happens if the disk is solid, meaning not an annulus and oops.
In particular, what I would like you, if you get to this part, what I'd like you to think about is what's changing with the azimuthal stress. If you get here, we can chat about it. Your boundary conditions are different. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm gonna again say that this is your radius, this is the inner radius is A, the outer radius is B. And I don't think you need to know anything else. Everything else is the same radial coordinates where you think it is, the azimuthal coordinates in the, uh, the direction of the angular speed per. Uh, which is radians per second. So start here. I guess I should, this is, I guess, step zero is what is this? And then make your way through here. Questions before I send you off into breakout rooms. Thanks. I did not know I was needed. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, hopefully you made some good progress on that problem. Uh, hopefully you saw some of the similarities, both in terms of actual like, equations being similar in some points, but also more broadly, what I'm trying to convey to you here is we've picked two problems to work through in detail, but the approach to these problems is very similar. So I talked to each group individually, and so hopefully you came to the conclusion that the body force vector, this is a force per unit volume. The force per unit volume due to the rotation is going to be rho times omega squared times r. You can determine this a bunch of different ways, um, but even something as simple as dimensional analysis, which tells you, well, rho is mass per volume. I need a force per volume. Divergence of stress is basically sum of the forces equals zero. In this case, we have an inertial term, so we should expect some of the forces equals MA. Our, in this case, it's gonna be mass per volume times A. Mass per volume is our density, so what's the acceleration? Well, you have something that's an angular speed. We need something that's gonna be length per time squared. So the angular speed squared gives you one over time squared. What's the length? The length is where are you on the coordinate of the CD? The further are you at R, the further you are away, the, the larger the force due to acceleration. So your force vector should have been rho omega squared times R. One of the things I hope you recognize in your calculation is that the equations for stress is equal to some function of u, this was the second point or the second step on my list, should have been identical to the, pro to the stress as a function of u from last time. So you should have had the, the same equation, sigma r is equal to e over one minus nu squared times u prime plus nu times u over r. Same exact equations for stress related to displacement. Now what's different is your equilibrium equation. In the thick wall pressure vessel problem, we took D, the derivative of sigma R with respect to R, plus the difference in our two stresses over R equals zero. In this case, all of that's the same, except it doesn't equal zero, it equals the negative of our uh, body force vector. Mathematically, what this means is the thick wall pressure vessel problem is an example of the homogeneous version of this problem in which all the dependent uh, variables, u, u prime, u double prime, uh, are all on one side of the equation and then they equal zero. In this problem, we have if we collect all the dependent variables, u, u prime, u double prime, they should equal the opposite of your body force vector. That is 
solvable by hand. It's a pain, just like kind of the way the last version was. Um, but if you know the particular solution to the ODE, then what you can do is just add the homogeneous solution to the particular solution. If this is going over your head, then you can use Mathematica to help you through this process and ask it to solve the ODE for you. In the Mathematica notebook I gave you, I do that here. Um, and then once again here to, to solve and simplify. Um, so this is the ODE that I had, which has uh, U, U prime, I'm oh, sorry, U, U, U prime, U double prime, and then two terms that you could combine uh, if you simplify it uh, such that these terms don't depend on U at all. So this, if you were to do this in like a differential equations way, you would move all these terms to the same side. They all depend on U of R in some way. And all these terms to the other side, they don't depend on you. This is the non-homogeneous component of your solution. Mathematica doesn't really care. It's going to solve this ODE for U of R uh, with the independent variables of R. It, for some reason, helps to tell it that R is a real variable or real, uh, real number. And you end up with something that looks like this. And I point this out just to say, hey, remember, this was the homogeneous solution to the problem we solved last time. C1 over R plus R times C2 was the exact same solution we had. The only difference is we added to the homogeneous solution our particular solution, which is that term there. So this hopefully is ringing some bells for you from differential equations, uh, of course, that you took a while back. Um, Okay, uh, what am I doing here? I think I, oh, I'm just calculating the derivative of R because what we're going to do now is put, so again, we have an ODE that we solved for you. It was a second order ODE. So we have two boundary conditions we need. But in this case, we don't know anything. Just like last case, we don't know anything about displacement. And because we don't know anything about displacement, we can't really apply boundary conditions directly to this uh, function. So what we need to do is we need to go back to our stress equations, just like we did last time, where we had stress as a function of u and a function of u prime. And now we can insert u. And so this is u. This is u. And we can insert u prime, which is this into our stresses and apply our boundary conditions. And so the question is, what are our boundary conditions? Well, just like with the last problem, we knew something about the pressure, therefore kind of the stress exerted on the inner and outer walls of the thick wall pressure vessel. They were equal to the inner and outer pressures. In the case of a spinning disc, we also know something about the stresses at the inner and outer boundary. We know that there's no pressure there. So the stress at R equals A and the stress at R equals B have to be zero. So we can take U and U prime, insert them back into our equations for stress. So here's what I'm doing here. My equation for stress, inserting U prime, inserting U. I get two equations and two unknowns. And I can have it solve this system of equations here for my two unknowns, giving the boundary conditions that this thing should equal zero when R equals A, and this thing should equal zero when R equals B. And I can solve my constants here. And they look bad, but they're not too bad. I can now insert these constants back into my stress equations to get my radial and azimuthal stresses. And they look bad as well. They're here. This is the radial stress. This is the azimuthal stress. And once again, once we put the constants back into U of R, we can find out what the displacement of the, of the spinning disk is in the radial direction. This thing is spinning and spinning and spinning, which is causing it to stretch out, stretch out, stretch out. And you can see that the relationship between how fast it's spinning and how it stretches out is rather complicated.
how do you find where the maximum radial stress is? Did anyone get to this point? And if so, what did you do? If you didn't get to this point, what do you think you would do? Yeah, so what's being said in class here is I'm asking you what the maximum radial stress is. To find the maximum radial stress, you take your radial stress, differentiate it with respect to R, set that equal to zero, and that'll determine where the maximum radial stress is in your problem. So that's done here. You can plot it to see. So this is the radial stress. It starts at zero. We expected that. There's no pressure there. It rises to some maximum value somewhere over here. And then it decreases to, some, to zero again at the outer edge. So just like any other function you've ever used, if you want to find where this point is, you differentiate the function, set that derivative equal to zero, and solve for r. And what you would find is that the solution is the geometric mean of your disk, which means it's got two dimensions, A and B. The geometric mean is going to be take the product of those two, take the square root of that. So the maximum radial stress occurs at the square root of A over B. You could also ask other questions like, hey, is the radial stress the largest? Is the radial stress the smallest? The azimuthal stress is not zero at the edges. You can see here the azimuthal stress at the inner boundary of the CD is really, really large. And as the mutual stress decays as you get uh, further uh, towards the edge of the edge of the disk. This is a non-trivial function here. But you can compare kind of your uh, azimuthal to radial stresses to understand, you know, in your spinning disk, what are the stresses that are going to cause failure? Is it the radial stress? Is it the azimuthal stress? And so on. What follows this, you don't have to worry about any of the code, of course. I'm just trying, I want to be able to show you and help you visualize what the stress profile looks like in a spinning disc, which is different from the thick wall pressure vessel. Which remember the thick wall pressure vessel, depending on the magnitude of the outer pressure or the inner pressure, had its largest stresses at either the outer wall or the inner wall. We just solved this problem and found that our largest stresses should occur at the square root of A over B. Sorry, the square root of A times B. So I picked an arbitrary thing. I took a Blu-ray disc. The dimensions of a Blu-ray disc has an inner radius of 11 millimeters, an outer radius of 58.5 millimeters. It's made out of polycarbonate. We can pull up the material properties and Poisson ratio and uh, mass density of polycarbonate and kind of play with what spin speeds we're going to look at here. We can visualize what that stress is going to be. So don't worry about any of the code here. This is just a way to make a fancy graph in Mathematica. And here's what that fancy graph looks like. Here's this thing spinning at 225.8 RPMs. I just arbitrarily dragged my little slider here. You can play with this if you want. But what you see is the stress is indeed zero at the inner wall, zero at the outer wall. It increases to some maximum. I overlaid a circle of radius square root of A times B, which is that black line there. That's just a, to show you where the largest stress is. And you can see that the stress profile in this disk is very different than the stress profile of a thick wall pressure vessel. I think I can animate this thing. I don't think I ever did it. I don't know if it'll work. Let me try it, I guess. This might yell at me. Let's see if this works. Well, that might not. We'll see. I'll let that run for a minute. So a couple of things I want to point to here. The first problem really was a problem where we solved the divergence of stress equals zero for a problem that's axisymmetric and in polar coordinates. We were able to, a couple of lectures ago, reduce the field equations from 3D to 2D by assuming that there's really no stress difference through the thickness of the CD. That made it 3D to 2D. And then we were able to go from 2D to 1D by solving 
uh, by applying uh, conditions of symmetry, going to a 1D set of problems, we're able to solve this 1D set of problems. In the, in the limit in which there's no body force, you end up with solving the sum of the forces equals zero, a static problem. In this case, when there is a body force, an inertial body force, we were solving sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. We had to do a little bit of math using our kinematic equations, our constitutive equations, our equilibrium equations, solving a differential equation, applying the boundary conditions, and we're able to determine the stress profile in a thick wall pressure vessel and in a spinning disc, a rotary uh, blade or, or whatever variant of this problem uh, you're interested in. The, the procedures are very similar. And so I, I wanted to get make sure that that's really clear to you. This approach of, okay, how does strain relate to displacement? Okay, how does stress relate to strain? Okay, what do I know about my stress equations? They should be divergence free, or they, the divergence of them should equal some whatever body force is acting on them. And at that point, you're just kind of turning the crank. You have you're inserting one thing into another equation, that into another, you end up with an ordinary differential equation, you know how to solve that. The trick is maybe a finding and applying the boundary conditions. So let me ask you a question. I don't think anyone got to the, to the problem in which the disc was not an annulus, but it was a solid disc with no center. Can, what do you think the ba two boundary conditions are for a disc that has no inner radius to it. So a solid disc. What are the boundary conditions? So close. We have a one question in class is about where where the stress is zero, and I will tell you the stress is still zero at the outer edge because there's no pressure still. But we don't now know what's happening about the stresses at the inner edge because there's no reason why the stresses would necessarily be some particular value there. But what do we know? Nothing, no guesses. That's a good question. So the question, the guess in class here was. What if, what if we know that the stress is a maximum at the square root of A times B? So that kind of blows up here. And there's two reasons why that doesn't work. The one reason why that doesn't work, it's a good guess. But the one reason why that doesn't work is we know the stress is, should be the largest there, but we don't actually know what it is. So we can't put a number in there. But the main reason why that doesn't work is because that's no longer true. Because what happens if you put in A is equal to zero, the stress is actually gonna be the largest at the inner portion of the disk there. So what we do know is nothing about the, the stress other than the fact that it's zero at the outer edge of the disk. However, if this is a spinning solid disk, we know a restriction on displacements and that is the radial displacement at the center of the disc has to be zero. If you have a disc that's going from like this size to this size, the center point can't move. Typically you're pinching it there anyway, so you're spinning around there. But even if you weren't, even this thing where it was kind of free and just spinning in some 
of like say gravitational field, the center point of that disk, there can't be any displacement of those points. The material points away from the center will displace, get bigger as you're spinning faster, but that point in the center there has to stay the same. So the two binary conditions for the solid disk are no stress, radial stress on the outer edge, no radial displacement at the center of the disk. If you solve that set of problems, what you'll find is that the really big change is, is the effect that it has on the azimuthal stress. And the azimuthal stress basically uh, doubles, uh, is double um, uh, for a solid disk than when, than when there's an angular disk. And so you get a significant increase in your azimuthal stress uh, in this spinning object. Okay, that's all for me today. You have homework due next Wednesday. Um, and I'll see you in a couple of days. Thanks, everyone.